Operational definitions. What is a team? What are project teams? What are work teams? What are focus teams? What is your team infrastructure? How many teams do you have? I can give you examples of team names and team definitions, but to make this your own, you have to come up with your own operational definitions. Formal teams are groups of people that are expected to interact with each other in order to achieve a desired result. If your people do this as a majority of their workday and stay on the same team, then they're a work team. So people in a coffee shop, people in an outpatient clinic, people in an re automotive repair shop, your work team folks. If you're part of a group that meets less frequently but on a planned basis, you're also a member of a formal team and there's two types of formal teams, improvement teams and focus teams. To me, the informal teams are those groups that meet in the lunchroom, at the coffee machine, some call them cliques, but they're not part of some grand organizational plan to improve performance. They're important. The way they communicate, change, and information is very important, but they're not teams you can build into the strategic design of the organization. So in this lesson, the following operational definitions are used. You've heard my team definition multiple times already, but it's a group of people who need each other to accomplish one or more results. They share information, solve problems, improve processes, and or provide a service. It's a mix. It depends on the organization. Informal teams are two or more people who interact with each other in an attempt to get their jobs done or otherwise improve the enterprise. That's often between process groups within the value stream or between support groups and the value stream itself. Formal teams, two or more people who interact with each other on a structured, planned basis as a result of their job design or special assignment. Okay, so three types of formal teams. Teams that we could actually, on paper, say this is the percentage of labor hours that go to these team types. We could do the math on this. Project teams. Focus teams, which are like safety committees, steering committees, regular managers meetings. They support the strategic objectives of the company. And then your work or process team, your work process team. And that is the main team that most people are on that are hourly. And so if you're in the value stream, you spend most of your time on a work or process team. If you support the value stream, you spend a very high percentage of your job on a worker process team. If you're a manager or leader, however, you spend much more time on the other two types of teams. Team types. Team types may vary by form, function, and name. And so by form, I mean where they work, are they cross-functional or not, do they represent a slice of the organization or do they represent a special skill mix? And then function, that's what we do at work. Are we there for work area improvement, organizational goal attainment, special project development? Teams obviously differ by the names they are given. More importantly, the team membership, that's the form of the team, and the function of the team, which is its focus, should be referenced to determine what types of teams you either have or should have. I always start with defining my work process teams because that's where the bulk of my time is spent. Then I say, what formal project teams do I have that support the strategic goals of the site or the organization? Then I say, what types of standing committees or focus teams do I have that meet regularly to support those strategic objectives? That often captures the bulk of our teams. Organizations usually have at least one representative team for each of the three team types, even though they may not consider these teams to be far part of a formal improvement effort or call them by the names I use in this lesson. In terms of function, organizations usually try to satisfy all three needs as well, but they may use individuals more than teams to accomplish them. So, everything I talk about here can be done by individuals working in a vacuum but that quality will suffer, effectiveness will suffer. You have to find the slider settings on your soundboard 
that give you the best results, that give you that harmony that drives your organization forward. To clarify the possible functions of a team, I'm going to give you a few more brief explanations. There is a little bit of overlap. Think about how do we spend our time at work? How do we spend our time on the team? What types of things do we focus on? So we have work area improvement. That's the environment that a group of people work in. You can usually improve that. You can say the same for the repetitive things we do in our jobs each day. Since the work group is the primary group impacted for such improvements, they need to be engaged to a very high degree for those types of change. Now, often, we don't have near as much of that happening as we should because we count on engineers to drive change and that limits your pace of change. So if you can get to the point to where your work area leaders can spend time working on projects that, that the team helps them come up with that improve their work area, that's where you start developing a much faster pace. Now, organizational goal attainment, we almost always have teams that support organizational goals, even if it's just the safety team, the quality team, the morale team, the engagement team, whatever you would like to call them. But these focus teams that fall into these category usually work on smaller projects that impact more of one group. So we're going to come up with a new recognition program within our safety committee, or we need to come up with a new way of evaluating training within our training committee, or the management team needs to come up with a new agenda that gives them a sharper focus on the daily needs of the site. So we'll make little changes within our group, but they'll often affect a, a lot of folks. Work area improvements contribute to the attainment of company goals, but rarely on their own. And so these groups, your focus teams might keep track of what the work area teams are working on. Also, your focus teams tend to be cross-functional. They tend to have people that represent multiple departments or groups on those teams. And then finally, you have special project development. These are project teams that are formed in most organizations to put major improvements in place. If you have an engineering group, this could be your special project group. Some folks choose to structure themselves that way. Some shoot for a hybrid or a blend. In contrast to work teams and focus teams, however, project teams usually disband after the project is completed. And from a leader standard work perspective, we want to charge our work to the projects that have capital and major expense monies associated with them. And then we can consider other time buckets for the remaining project time. You know, do, does the engineering group, for example, work on things to improve their work area? Do they work on specific organizational goals versus certain projects that support multiple goals? In most cases, we get too caught up in the names instead of being more concerned about why they need to exist and how they spend their time. What types of teams do you have? Three types of teams. You've heard that a lot already as we've progressed through this lesson. Some people feel that a group of people is not a team unless they're first of all effective, they actually accomplish something when they work together, or two, they're part of a formal improvement effort. They have a formal name because they're trying to put a special project in place or they're trying to improve quality or safety. One thing is clear. If putting the people together does not accomplish the desired function in an enhanced manner, then their collective time was largely wasted. You might have had a feel-good session, but did the organization benefit? Did the people truly benefit once the hubris has worn off, once the feel-good session's gone away? A simple way of looking at this argument is this. In an hour of time, you could spend one people hour or eight people hours for an eight-person team to accomplish a task. Is the extra investment in people hours that you make when you pull people together as a team value added in terms of the output realized? If it's not, the group effort was ineffective to some degree. And so in, here's what actually happened over time. If you go back to the quality circle manuals, they used to advocate 8 to 12 person teams. And by the time reengineering was done 10 to 15 years later, between 1980 and 1995, the recommended team size had gone down to four to six people for the standing team. And that's simply because you cannot, it's very hard to get to a point where consistently eight people hours provides more value than one people hour in a meeting. 
But four people hours in a meeting might provide much more value than one person hour working for the four hours independently. Anyway, don't get caught up in all that, but do give it some thought. Is the group effort worth it? Work area teams are forced by the design of the job. You hire on to those teams to work together to some degree to execute a process, either within the value stream or to support the value stream or to improve those two streams, types. Your efforts on work area teams should be made to ensure that group efforts are effective as well. Sadly, the effectiveness of these groups is often ignored as long as the site hits their goals. You don't, we don't necessarily worry about in-process measures or soft measures such as morale for the group as long as the group has overall success. Now, once you start to formalize your team process, you're going to advocate measuring at the process level for all key processes, for all key performance areas, and then you're starting to formalize those teams. But you should because that's where you spend lots of money. It's where you spend lots of time. The other two types of teams, project and focus, should not be used unless they're going to be properly supported and their effectiveness considered. Remember, there's very successful small businesses that don't even have project and focus teams. That's just blended into the leader's job and they work through it with their work team. But the leader drives project and focus team efforts in smaller organizations, smaller sites. It's pure math. You can only have so many leaders and so many teams when you're a 15 person, $20 million a year organization. Okay, give that some thought. Now, most organizations have lots of meetings. Does the meeting not serve as evidence of a project or focus team existence, or at least the need for the existence? It's something to think about. Why are we meeting? In so many cases, we meet just because, well, someone says we need to get together. Or I have to make sure it's passed down to my different groups. And so you sit with each group instead of maybe sharing it through technology. But think about your team types. Think about where the majority of your work time goes. Think about how you might measure the effectiveness of each of these three team types. And we're going to start building a team infrastructure here in just a little bit. Now, there's an operational definitions worksheet in the book that you may want to experiment with. At some point, I think it's valuable to come up with these basic definitions. And I gave you mine as a reference, but do not feel that you've got to adopt it. In fact, I actually don't want you to adopt it word for word. I want you to make it your own. But they're very simple. What is a team? What is a project team? What is a focus team? What is a worker process team? And this is in the Great Systems Facilitating and Leading Teams print book or ebook that you can get from Amazon.com. What types of teams do you have? Did you notice that the word effectiveness was not included in any of the example definitions? Teams can and do exist without necessarily reaching a significant level of effectiveness. So how we spend our time at work defines the team. Effectiveness is defined by how we perform against a standard set of measures. Unfortunately, people who work together regularly are often not considered to be a team unless they are part of some formal corporate change process. Have you ever heard someone say, well, we used to have teams, but they weren't worth the hassle? It's very sad but I've been in many organizations that are like this. People don't see their daily job as a team-based experience. By creating operational definitions for each team type, the first step in team infrastructure design is accomplished. And so the operational definitions worksheet that I just went over will help you come up with working definitions for your business, for your enterprise, for your not-for-profit. As each organization either formally or by practice, has its own team definitions. Use my examples, but please modify them. Completing the definition process sounds easier than it actually is in many cases because we get so hung up in the semantics. If we lose sight of how job design serves as the basis for team definitions, 
You will also most likely struggle with outreach and consensus group definitions. So think about how do the people spend their time at work? What is the purpose of the team? We have a tendency to gravitate towards a particular set of team names because of the image they promote. Kaizen teams or the message they're intended to send to the workforce. Operational excellence teams. Now this has been a battle I've been fighting for a while. And back in the day I was involved with the Association for Quality and Participation's Team Excellence Award. I helped design the criteria over t- almost 30 years ago now. And in 1999, I just did a survey of the 27 teams that were participating in the award, the finalists, and how they named their problem-solving teams. Because all of these teams that participated in this award were in general problem-solving teams. We tried to get work teams to contribute, but so few organizations actually saw their work teams as teams. You can see that we ended up with problem-solving teams were 8 out of 27, cross-functional teams, 4 out of 27, innovative teams, 5 out of 27 teams, Kaizen teams was just coming on back then. If we did this now, Kaizen teams would probably be the most popular uh, process improvement teams, 5 out of 27. And we still had some quality circles hanging on, 4 out of 27, even in 1999. Per the definitions used in this lesson, these teams are all the same type. They're all project teams. They all meet together on a regular basis to accomplish their project. But this time does not constitute the bulk of their job, and when the projects are over, the team is done. They may move on to a different project. They may disband. Most of these teams are cross-functional by design, but not necessarily by names. Kaizen teams typically complete their project in much less time, their fast cycle improvement teams, than the traditional quality circle. But the end product in either case is a finished project. When are process improvement teams not expected to be innovative? So we always expect innovation. It's not just certain teams that we want to be our innovative teams. Now, I'm being a little silly, a little cynical here, but when we get caught up in all the buzzwords and the names, we lose sight on the purpose of the team. What troubles me more is the fact that most of us spend a lot of time in a team setting each day with little thought being given to how effective our teams are or what could be done to improve that effectiveness. We spent a lot of money on team meetings and team skill training without any means of gauging if our investments are making a difference or not. In short, we take our process work and focus teams largely for granted. Do you measure the performance of your safety committee? Do you measure the performance of your customer service team? across all key measures. Once you have to find what a team is and what types of teams you have, you can begin talking about what effectiveness would look like for each team type. So notice the sequence. Definitions first. What types of teams do you have based on those definitions? And then what are some example effectiveness scorecards or measures for each team type? These definitions of team type are not specific to an organizational layer of group. Any people in an organization can be on any type of team. The definitions are primarily based on job design and how the group spends its time together. What do we do? How do we spend our time? After we take a look at the three different types of teams and why different type teams are needed, we're going to start exploring team effectiveness and the investments that are required to sustain it over time. The potential impact of teams. Why would an organization use teams instead of individuals to make improvements? Teams have the potential for enhancing project quality, project impact, project time to market, team building. How do you decide when to use a team? So what should you expect from project teams? What is or was your company's primary measure of team process success? Did you focus primarily on dollars saved, projects completed, or participation percentages? If you did, what happened to these measures as your team process matured? Did the dollars saved grow smaller, the number of completed projects shrink, and the participation percentage decline? 
Companies usually implement a formal team process because they believe it will reduce costs, both in the short and long terms. Few, however, put teams in place merely for the social benefit of letting people talk to each other at work but away from their regular jobs. They expect the teams to do something. But it wasn't that long ago, however, that teams were formed without first defining general and let alone specific expectations for each team. One of the main reasons today's Kaizen and Six Sigma team approaches work is that teams are not formed without first defining the specific goals and focus of those teams. And so if you just look at how Jack Welch built the Six Sigma program from an infrastructure perspective and compare it to the more freelance perspective that existed with Quality Circles at the start of the 80s, you can see where there was some recognition of the things I'm talking about and how we need to be more proactive in designing an infrastructure of team effectiveness. Now, in a voluntary participation process, management's often hesitant to define challenging expectations of project teams. They don't want to run off people. They don't want to drive down their participation rate. Their fear is that if they have their expectations set or that if they're set too high, the teams will feel too pressured and they'll disband. They'll leave local management the task of explaining to corporate office why their participation percentage declined last month. However, without defined expectations for each team, the output of the team as well as the overall team infrastructure will be compromised. We'll have pockets of excellence. We'll have certain teams that are stars, but we're not coming close to getting what we should get for the time we're investing. Expectations are not enough, however. Project team output is directly proportional to the degree of support a given project team receives. We're going to now take a closer look at how these different types of support and other factors drive team performance. Defining your innovation threshold. How many projects do you need to work on? Which projects will teams work on? Which projects will individuals work on? How many simultaneous projects can be supported? In total, how fast can you improve? A formal team infrastructure helps ideas flow through the organization. The overall speed and volume of idea conversion into improvements is determined by five things. First of all, the number and types of teams that we have active. Second, the frequency and duration of team meetings. Three, how effective each team is when it meets. Four, how much time is spent on project work between meetings. And five, how closely team efforts are aligned with the goals of the organization. So you could build an algorithm for idea flow and improvement in an organization looking at those five factors. This lesson focuses on how to provide both project teams and work teams with the type of support needed in order for them to be effective. There are similarities between the requirements for both team types, but there are also some significant differences. Because innovation is long, key to long-term organizational success, Project team support will be emphasized. This doesn't mean that innovation cannot come from work teams. It just means that work teams do not have time to develop and implement innovations. Unfortunately, there's a limit as to how many projects an organization can effectively be working on at any point in time. I call that an innovation threshold. The support structure for project teams that you have in place helps define this threshold. To get more projects completed, you have to improve your project team support system. It's key that you make the distinction between the activities of project teams and those of work teams. Referring to your operational definitions should help you make this distinction, but too many organizations expect work teams to complete projects and they simply don't have time. Project teams provide innovations, step changes in performance as they convert ideas into implemented projects. Work teams ensure that each project is incorporated into one or more standard practices. Work teams also continually tweak these processes and practices to make them more and more effective until the next innovation comes along. Work teams also help identify additional improvements that are needed. 
So it's very much like an orchestra. You need both types of those teams. Now I gave you a worksheet for defining your innovation threshold in the workbook. And that's where you can work through these different factors that I've talked about. So when should project teams be used? Well, to begin with, let's think about it that many organizations, especially when teams were the rage, when it was cool to have a team, attempted to use formal project teams for any kind of problem or improvement that, were need ar that arose. You may have worked in a place like this. You know, a problem comes up and they say, oh, let's form a team to solve it. That would make me cringe because I know we can only support so many teams and we have teams that are struggling already. Unfortunately, organizations like these soon found out that first of all, they can only support so many project teams at one time. And second of all, teams are not necessarily the best solution for all problems. One only has to look at the once popular but now little known quality circle approach to gain a sharper perspective of these constraints. For example, many quality circles only average two to three projects a year and some only complete one. If the project is of any significance, how can the company afford to wait even six months for the improvement to be put in place? And that's where the fast cycle teams, the Gemba teams, the Kaizen teams started to emerge. This is especially concerning when the improvement is expected to save money. And so we have to look at, is our participation program a charity program, or do we expect these teams to get something done, and how quickly? The way you decide to support your project teams will greatly determine their output rate. Here's where organizations get in trouble. They set high expectations, but provide little support. You must define this expected output rate in order to determine which projects should be given to teams. As a general rule, teams take longer than individuals to complete a project in terms of calendar days, unless the teams are highly skilled. Well-trained teams are like having six or eight people working on a project at one time instead of one or two. That's like our examiner teams on site visits. Almost anyone on a national site visit could lead the team if we needed to have the team led by someone different and they're all working on similar types of work towards a common goal. Many teams, however, are not this well-trained. Two or three people are, and the others just sit back and provide thoughts. One or two people end up doing most of the work, and the other team members simply provide feedback, and that's not efficient. It's also not engaging enough for those people that just provide feedback. Most people want to do more than that. Now, we can go old school, and just give everything to individuals and say the heck with teams. You'll get your work done quickly, but idea quality and especially ownership of the change will suffer. And so the true solution lies in blending the right mix of individuals and team efforts into each improvement initiative. This blend will most likely change with each new project that comes along. How do you decide which projects will be developed by a team? One innovation in infrastructure that certain companies have used with project teams involves completely removing the team members from their regular job until the project is completed. They call these Kaizen Blitz teams, and when companies use them, they've been able to work through most project development cycles in as little as three days. So that's a fast cycle improvement team. If you need improvements fast and you have the most of the necessary data at your ready, at your fingertips, this is the best approach to use. But skilled team members and you can get data quickly. So this is where the high performers go you know, as they refine their data collection processes, as they define their team skills, as they develop their leadership capacity. Some high performing companies have learned that project teams must exist on an ongoing basis in order to consistently improve organizational performance over time in all areas of importance. You must have a project team engine to achieve your goals and to stay ahead of the competition. They've designed the jobs of a majority of their people to include time for both project work and process team meetings and the regular job. In other words, each employee's job description along with each department's budget reflects the expectation that project, focus, and work teams will be used to put improvements, both large and small, in place 
and that all work groups will contribute to that cause. Other infrastructure design options will be presented later in this lesson. For now, begin forming your own ideas about when teams should be used to work on projects and to what degree. I provided worksheets in the workbook to help you define how many projects you both need to develop and can work on in a given amount of time.